welcome to Christian Answers. My name is Pastor Jeff Short, and today we're going to be talking about a seasonal topic, and that is we're going to be talking about Christmas. And a lot of uh, sermons have been given on Christmas, a lot of uh, talk about Christmas during the Christmas season every year in churches, and so it's one of the, the main staple themes of the year in the Christian calendar. But what I want to talk about today is a little bit different, and the reason I'm thinking about this sort of different theme than you might typically hear about Christmas is because, one, I'm always looking for different themes that would be relevant to people around Christmas time because, after all, most people have heard over and over again the same themes that have been preached on and taught on all over the world for year after year after year. And it's important to go back over those same themes every year, but it's also important to come at them from a different angle. And so without uh, compromising the scripture, without changing anything in the story of Christmas and the accounts in the Bible, without doing any injustice to the Christmas season or Christ Christmas themes, I'm going to try to come at Christmas a little bit different this year in this program. And what prompted me was the work of a really important intellectual in our age today. And his name is Jordan Peterson. And he is one of the top public intellectuals, I would say, in the world right now. And his uh, videos are shown all over the place. He's on talk shows and radio interviews. And he's just everywhere, it seems like, all over the place. And he's from the University of Toronto. He's a professor of psychology. And he's, while he's not a Christian, I would not call him or classify him as a Christian in the biblical orthodox sense, he has given some lectures on something that is biblical, even though he himself is not a biblical Christian, he has lectured on a topic that is biblical, and that is natural theology, and that is the, the signs of God the evidence of God, the proof of God, the revelation of God that is given in nature and given in the created world. And we know that God created the world because it says in the Bible, in the early chapters of Genesis, it gives an account of how God created the world. And we know that the fingerprints of God are all over the created order. So people, it says in Romans 1, Paul gives the argument, people are without excuse because God's power and his very being are known through his creation. So no one can say there wasn't enough evidence, there wasn't enough proof for God, because God is known everywhere on the planet earth because of the creation, because of the proofs that are embedded in the very nature of things because of God's creative act. And so whether you're an American or whether you're an Aborigine in Australia or whether you're a European or an African or South American, wherever you're located, because you're a human being, you have the capacity to look out and, as I'll talk about today, look in and see the created order and know that God is and know some other things about God. Well, one of the things that Jordan Peterson has done is he has taught people uh, following the famous psychologist Carl Jung that there are symbols that are embedded in all cultures that these symbols resonate in everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a primitive member of culture in Papua New Guinea, or if you're a sophisticated Frenchman in Europe, these symbols are embedded in you because of being a human being. Now, as a biblical Christian, I say 
the Bible teaches that we are all made in the image of God, the image and likeness of God. And so we have these moral sensibilities built within us. Even though, even if we don't even follow the moral sensibilities, even if we don't follow these moral instincts that are within us, we have them in there by virtue of the fact that we are human beings and we're made in the image of God. Every human being, whether primitive or sophisticated, modern or ancient, black or white, doesn't matter what race, it doesn't matter what religion, it doesn't matter what your politics are. If you're a human being, you are made in the image of God. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, we are all fallen creatures made in the image of God, and that image of God has been distorted, it's been twisted, it's been corrupted, but that doesn't erase it totally. And there are remnants of these symbols and these truths that are embedded within each individual by virtue of being in the image of God. And so these symbols in every person's heart come out in the cultures that they live in. For example, if you read Carl Jung, he talks about these archetypal symbols that are found in every religion, every culture, all this, all the ancient stories in the cultures. And I first heard about this 20 or 30 years ago when I was reading the Christian theologian John Warwick Montgomery in his series on apologetics where he started talking about Carl Jung and talking about these embedded symbols that are hardwired into us uh, by virtue of our created in the image of God. And he was mentioning that if you look, and he's basically repeating Carl Jung, and this is something that Jordan Peterson is talking about now, but I first heard about it from John Warwick Montgomery about 20 or 30 years ago in respect to apologetics. And in respect to apologetics, the application is very clear. You can talk to people about morality and the conscience and instincts, and you can do so because they are made in the image of God. Now, if they're not made in the image of God, you would have no contact point because all morality would be totally arbitrary. But because people are made in the image of God and because they know that there are rights and there are wrongs. It's not just a social construct that we hear a lot today. You know, the big thing today is in postmodern thought is that all morality, all ethics, it's all just a social construct. You know, humans made it up, man made it up, sometimes long ago, sometimes just a short while ago, but it's not anything connected with any transcendent moral values. Well that's false because we look within ourselves and we find that we we have a moral sense of right and wrong and what Carl Jung was saying is that this is found universally all throughout all religions universally all throughout all cultures and that it's not just an arbitrary item within all these cultures it's something that is universal. And as Christians, we, we realize this is universal because God made us that way. And this is the whole very point of we have a contact point. And John Warwick Montgomery, as a good theologian and apologist, talked about this. So did also Francis Schaeffer talk about the fact that we have a contact point with everyone, no matter what their culture is, no matter what their professed religion is. We have a contact point in this moral intuition that everyone has. Now, different cultures have distorted that. And so when they go to apply that moral intuition, sometimes it comes out distorted. Sometimes it comes out twisted. Uh, but that is not to deny that it's there. And so uh, it's there. And why is it there? 
that's the question. And as Christians, we know why it's there because we're all made in the image of God and we all have these principles of truth sprinkled about in our, hum in our humanity. Even if you're an atheist, this is what's so inconsistent with atheism. You have this atheist, for example, Christopher Hitchens, and he gets really mad and he's really upset and he's really raging against injustices in the world. But if you're a complete atheist, you would have no basis for that outrage. You would have no basis, rational basis for that rage because you don't believe in God and you don't believe in absolute principles and you don't believe that there are real rights and wrong. You believe it's only a matter of social construct if you're a postmodern atheist or you believe that they might be things that uh, co have come through the ages, the ancients world gave us some traditions and we follow that uh, because it's been helpful and so on and so forth. But you really can't believe that there are real right, universal rights and wrongs and that people should follow them because if you did, that would betray the fact that you actually do believe in transcendent values and that you actually do judge people on the basis of their adherence to these transcendent values. And that would make you something other than an atheist. You wouldn't be an atheist then. Because if you're a true atheist, you do not believe in universal moral values. You do not believe in actual right and actual wrong. And you have no basis, rational basis, for actually making moral judgments. But atheists still do, like Christopher Hitchens. He is enraged, he is mad, he is upset when he looks out in the news and sees injustice. But again, he has no rational basis for that within his own worldview. But Christianity does have a rational basis for it because it fits perfectly in with the understanding that we have of people made in the image of God. And so when I talk about these symbols that are embedded in every person, no matter what age, no matter what culture, we're looking at something that is an artifact of the image of God. And that now one of the consequences of this is that when we come to a season, for example, like Christmas, and we look at the Christmas nativity accounts found in the Gospels, there are all kinds of symbols within these stories that resonate with people no matter what culture they are, no matter what time period that they live in, whether it's ancient or modern, no matter if it's sophisticated culture or primitive culture or just run-of-the-mill culture, there are symbols embedded in the Christmas accounts that resonate in everyone. And you don't have to be a believer, you don't have to be a Christian, you don't have to be a Westerner, but these, these, these powerful embedded symbols that are within everyone resonate. And what Jung was talking about in these archetypal symbols and what C.S. Lewis, for example, uh, found in his reading of cultures and the literature of the different religions of the world is that all of these religions and all of these cultures have these symbols in their writings here and there in a haphazard, slipshod way. They're disorganized, they're incoherent in some instances, but these symbols are all present but only within Christianity are these symbols not only present in the accounts, the written text of the Bible, but they're historical symbols. The symbols have taken on an actual material form. They have become not only just embedded symbols within 
the mind of the gospel writers and in the minds of Christians, they're actually historical realities that have occurred in real space and time. So, for example, in, during the Christmas account, it talks about in the Gospels, in the days of Caesar Augustus. So, it's talking about a historical event that happened. And within these historical events are these powerful symbols that resonate throughout all cultures. The only difference is in the other cultures, they're stories. In the other cultures, they're legends, they're pictures, they're symbols, they're stories that people tell. In Christianity, they're not just stories, they're not just symbols, they're not just pictures. They don't just represent something, they're actually concrete tangible historical realities. There really was a baby born of a virgin. There really was a baby that was both God and man and who became a mediator between heaven and earth. There really was a star of Bethlehem that guided the wise men to the manger of the baby Jesus uh, and and so on you can go through the entire Christmas account as found in the Gospels and you will realize that all of these powerful symbols that are jumping out are resonating with all kinds of people in all kinds of cultures and so in Christianity you have the fulfillment of these embedded symbols that we find scattered about all throughout creation and the cultures of creation. And so why is that? Why is that? Well, that makes perfect sense. You know, the Bible talks about uh, in Romans, the first chapter, the Apostle Paul describes that all men are without excuse because God has made himself clear. Now, when we read these accounts like what Paul is saying in, in, in the first chapter of Romans, we usually take them to mean that when we look up in the starry sky, we feel something. We realize intuitively that there is a God and that he is ordering all things. And that's part of it. That's the external witness of general revelation or natural revelation. See, there are, are two kinds of revelation that the Bible talks about. In the first chapter of Romans, it talks about natural revelation. And it describes that God's power and his Godhead, his deity, are clearly seen by what was created, by what is created. So you have that natural revelation that you can see from his creation. And like I said before, we usually take that in the sense of looking up in the sky and seeing the stars and the planets and looking at the sun and the cycles of the seasons. And we take that to mean there is something ordering everything here. And that something is a good something because he orders it, for example, the seasons of harvest, the planting of the harvest. He allows the sun and the water to work in conjunction with the soil and the seed to produce harvest. And so we have crops that come up that we can feed on and sustain ourselves. And so these are all signs that not only is there order in the created universe, but there is a good orderer or there is a good creator that makes these things work on behalf of our well-being. And so we can reason from nature by looking out externally from us and say that there is a good God out there, but we don't know very much more than that. But it's not only externally that we can look out and know that God is God. We can also 
look inwardly. Like I was saying before, we have these moral principles of conscience that we look at and we say to ourselves, who put this sense of right and wrong within us? Why do I feel like I'm obligated to love my neighbor as I love myself? Why do I feel that this act is right and this act is wrong? And when I see someone doing something wrong, why do I feel that that is wrong? Why am I judging that person as right or wrong? And why do I feel that there are some things that are universally right and universally wrong? Well, because of God's embedded morality within the heart of every person. Now, that's not enough because, as we all know, we can distort that, we can deny that, we can suppress that, we can do all kinds of things to nullify that. And that's why God gives us his special revelation, the Word of God, spoken through by prophets, inspired by God through his Holy Spirit, and then collected and put in the Bible. This is how we know for certain what God's will is. But that certain will of God found in the revelation of Scripture lines up with the natural revelation in the external world. And it also lines up with the internal natural revelation we find in each human soul. And part of that natural revelation, it's not just a sense of right and wrong, it's also these embedded symbols like Carl Jung was saying, and that Jordan Peterson now is the latest champion of this uh, and the most hope, highest profile Jungian uh, therapist out there speaking popular in the popular uh, arena. And he's talking about these symbols. And so when we come to the Christmas season, we may say, well, people are not going to listen to the Christmas account. Uh, They don't care about that. They may not consciously care about that, but subconsciously, they too, by virtue of being made in the image of God, they too resonate with the Christmas accounts in the Bible. They resonate with the story and account of Jesus, born of the Virgin, the God-man, the child born to save humanity, the Savior. These are all huge and major symbols that everyone resonates with. So when you say, oh, I don't think my relatives, my friends, my neighbors, they don't want to hear this Christmas account they're just going to laugh. It's not going to be uh, very meaningful to them. You have to realize that it's not just you telling someone about the Christian Christmas account found in the Bible. It's you connecting with another fellow human being on a level that's deeper than the rational. They may say to you, oh, I don't buy that. You know, I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't believe that Jesus came as a savior to save humanity from their sins. I don't even believe in sin. I don't believe in this, that, and the other. They may tell you that, but that doesn't mean that they don't connect with the very themes and the accounts that we see in the Bible. They do. And so when we talk about uh, connecting with the, um, when they, when we talk about connecting with the, the, um, the story of uh, Jesus and the Gospels, Uh, We are not talking about speaking gibberish to secular people. Oh yeah, they're sophisticated. Oh yeah, they are going to act like they're not interested. But if they're human beings, if they're made in the image of God, which we know they are, they will be interested. They will connect with these powerful images and pictures and symbols 
that the Christmas nativity accounts give us. They will. There's, it's not even a question of, do you find this interesting? They can deny it all they want, but at a subconscious level, at a very deep and profound level, they find these things not only interesting, but profoundly interesting. And then it's up to them whether they are actually going to be honest and whether they are actually going to admit and be honest about the fact that, yeah, these are very powerful and that these make a lot of sense and that um, they can't help but uh, make a lot of sense to human beings because of, by virtue of the fact that we are all made in God's image. So uh, that's a very important insight that we can make. Now what I want to warn about is if you listen to Jordan Peterson, he will talk a lot about what I've just talked about, but on, a, on his level, he tends to he tends to minimize the actual Christian gospel message and he more or less talks about the the symbolic importance of it which is very much of a waste in my respect because if you're not going to allow the symbolic nature of it to to have its effect then you're missing out on the very essence of Christianity the essence of Christianity is not that these that the gospel writers um, came up with a fantastically uh, readable story that connects with everybody that's not the that's not the truth at all what the truth and the profound truth of Christianity is that these things that connect with everyone, they're true. They actually happened. The resurrection of Christ happened. The virgin birth of Christ happened. Um, the offer of salvation to the world actually happened. So it's not like you are admiring the depth of the profound symbols that Christianity introduces into the world in a coherent system. No, you're, you come to God by virtue of the fact that you embrace the truthfulness of these um, accounts. And you say, Jesus was born of the Virgin. He is the God-man. He's the mediator between God and man. He rose from the dead. He was crucified. He rose from the dead and so on and so forth. Where these things change your life. They save your soul. They transform the world. And so when we think of this Christmas, let's also talk to our relatives, our friends, our neighbors in terms of the image of God found in everyone and the fact that we can't get away from the, the fact that we're all human. We share a, a common humanity and that God has made us that way. And that's the basis of our communicating the gospel with others this Christmas season. Well, I hope that's helped you. We'll see you back next week on another edition of Christ and Culture. God bless.